Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, welcome, Mr. Cordray. It's not every day I have a constituent testify, so it's uh, good to have you here. And uh, apparently it's Central Ohio time because Ms. Beatty went, and now I'm going and in the back you'll see some folks from the Mid-Ohio Food Bank in Grove City, your hometown, that I'm going to meet with after this. But I, I want to thank you for what you're doing to um, try to protect consumers. But I will tell you, I do have some concerns about some of the methods your agency is using. And I, I'd like to kind of, if I have time, talk about auto dealers prepaid, and then if we get to it, TILA and RESPA. Okay. Um, so the, you may know that uh, the Department of Justice has created a framework, and, and I think both the national automobile dealers and the minority, owned uh, the minority auto dealers have developed a fair credit compliance program around the Department of Justice model, um, but I don't think any of that was um, used in the CFPB rule you're creating around uh, participation, participation of auto dealers. And I, I'm just curious, do you think the DOJ model doesn't work or it's not good, or did that just not enter into your thinking? So, so the way Congress drew our statute, again, this is another area where it's supposedly we're so well powerful, but we do not have jurisdiction over auto dealers. But you have, uh, and we've been you have, careful. you do have, and you're working on getting uh, information on their participation with lenders. So you're using the lender to get into the dealership. Now, we have responsibility to oversee fair lending by auto lenders, but not by auto dealers. So that the dealer program that they've developed may well be an excellent program, and we've, we've talked to them about it at their uh, suggestion. Uh, it's really for, more for the Justice Department to say what they think of that, not really within my uh, jurisdiction. Well, I do want to share that uh, I talked with one of my uh, auto dealers, and they gave me some stories about some folks from my area, your area, that actually got car loans um, through work at one of the auto dealers in our town, Reichert Automotive, just sure. down from where you live. Yeah, you and a, a lot of college students, a lot of first-time buyers, a lot of people with damaged credit have actually been able to secure car loans. I want to tell the story of a lady who um, needed a car to get back to work. Uh, she was a young lady in her 30s, recently divorced. Her husband had ruined their credit. She had three children. She needed to get back to work. She couldn't find a loan to get a car. And that dealership helped connect her with a lender that gave her a loan. And I I think that's a really good outcome, but they are worried that under your proposed rules that, you know, they might not be able to work with that lender to help increase the competition and get people like this lady that needed to go back to work alone. So uh, Yeah, I actually agree with you on that. Yeah. I think it is a good outcome. I think people need, trans at least where we live, people need cars to be able right. to transport themselves to work and keep a job. If they can't do that, it's worse than having a mortgage problem because they can always rent if they don't own a home. Right. But here they, they do need these loans. And I do think uh, the auto industry is going gangbusters right now. Uh, sales of cars are up. It is, but it's, there are is. people who can't get access to loans right now in cars because yeah. if you can't get access well, to I, a loan, you can't get access to a car. So I certainly don't I, want that to be as tight as I the I certainly wouldn't want now. your unintended consequences to be that you allocate you Fair know, enough. loans away from the people who are most in need. Fair enough. It's and not you, what I intended. I would use yeah. the Soviet grocery store as an example. Uh -huh. Sure, a yeah. Soviet grocery store never sold anybody bad vegetables or bad meat because they never sold anybody vegetables and meat. Yeah. They're always out of it. Yeah. So you can, that's not a, the right way to protect that's right. that, consumers. I, so that's I, not what we intend It's really important either. That, yeah. that I get that across. And, and that okay. transitions me to my next issue with regard to people that are in prepaid. And you talked about... Um, the short-term lending, and, and many of the folks that have short-term, do short-term lending, so-called payday lending, might be banked, but a lot of people on prepaid cards, that is their bank account. Agreed. Their card is their bank account, yep. and the way the, the proposed rules, and I know you're still taking, I think you're still taking comments. We are. The yep. way the proposed rules work, that overdraft protection would be treated as a credit card or a loan, but it's really... And so they'd have to take an application, they'd have to do some underwriting. It really will deny real access to these people. And I would ask you as strongly as I can to take a look. If there are practices you want to limit, if you think there's something that are best practices you want to encourage, you can do that, but don't take away people's access to this. Because if you make them opt in through an application, it'll never happen. And these people will get denied access to that overdraft protection 
uh, that they would have gotten if it was in a bank, but because their card is their account, they are being denied access. So I would ask you to look at the unintended consequences every time you do things from the car loans to the uh, prepaid cards to TILA and RESPA, which unfortunately I didn't get to because my time is up. But please look at it because you could become the you could make us the Soviet finance system if you deny access. Okay. Thank you, Mr. I'll Chairman. I'll be glad to talk back. further with you about 